Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs. Hey, welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast. Yes, this is the podcast where we empower you, the filmmaking entrepreneur. And a great way to get started is to get the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion while doing it. It's available in paperback, Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. And in fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com. That's survivetheimplosion.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Film Trooper Podcast. I'm your host, your fellow film trooper, uh, Scott McMahon. I'm your host for today. If you've listened to the uh, past few episodes, you've heard um, the indie film coach, Ron Newcomb, doing the podcast, and he'll have a a couple of follow-up episodes after this one. Anyway, my returning guest is Scott Kirkpatrick, the Senior Vice President at DRG, and you can learn more about DRG at drg.tv. And this episode is, is entitled, How to Sell Your Film to a Distributor. And we get to hear from the distribution's perspective of why and what, you know, goes on about them, you know, buying a film or film content. And Scott Kirkpatrick shares sort of a day in the life of a film executive. So without further ado, here he is, Scott Kirkpatrick, who's former guest on the show, also the author for Writing the Green Light, How to Make Your Script the One Hollywood Notices. So yes, without further ado, here is Scott Kirkpatrick on the Film Trooper Podcast. Most filmmakers come up to me and like our, you know, the people we know, like Jason Brubaker, and they just simply want to know, like, I finished a film or I finished a collection of films and I need to sell it. What do I do? And so we don't have to answer that directly just yet, but that's like the main question. And I think it might be interesting to hear sort of a day in the life of a film executive like yourself that has to go to the, all these different film markets all over the world. I mean, like you said, you just came back from MIPCOM, and we could discuss the difference between like MIPCOM and like a uh, Cannes film market or the American film market, the AFM coming up uh, here shortly. But it, I, th- I think it'd be my fascinating to hear, you know, what it's like to be daily life of somebody whose job is to buy and sell uh, film content, and 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 that way we could circle back to the main question is: so if you are independent producer. Or a filmmaker, and you have content that you're trying to sell, where it fits into the equation. Is that does that work for you? Yeah, that's great. Cool. So why don't we start with uh, like a day in the life? Like you said, you just got back from MIPCOM. If you can explain to everyone the difference between like MIPCOM and um, like the like uh, like feature film con- um, film markets. You you know the best way I describe it is that. A film festival, a traditional film festival, is kind of a celebration of cinema where mm-hmm. you can go watch really interesting, innovative movies, ones you might, frankly, not see anywhere else um, that just offer these really compelling voices and just, you know, open your eyes to a whole world of cinema outside the U.S. or, you know, in these little remote corners of the globe. Um, how that differs to a market is that. A market is very business oriented. It is the true business aspect of acquiring media content and selling it. Mm-hmm. it it's purely just, you know, titles, content, distribution, uh, revenue, etc. But a lot of these actually go together. So there is the very famous Cannes Film Festival. But in the exact same building, and actually the same building where I just was at MIPCOM, they're all in Cannes, France. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on the top floor, you have all the big premieres and the red carpet. But inside of that building, you have the uh, uh, the film market that's going on. And that's it's really not any different than what I was just attending last week. It, in fact, it's as I said, it's the same building. <laughs> it's the same furniture. Yeah. It's the same look. It's the same people for the most part. Um and what's going on in there is that every distribution company has a booth, you know, like 10 by 10 space um, for small companies. Uh, big studios are these gigantic booths that are amazing looking with great furniture and all kinds of cool stuff inside. And really what's going on is just, you know, they are talking about their slates of content and their international buyers are sitting with them and meeting with them and discussing which titles mesh with their international territory and they discuss terms and 
uh, you know, what deals would look like if they decide to move forward with stuff. They're all prearranged meetings. They're all, you know, kind of prearranged relationships in a way. And, um, you know, contrary to popular belief, although it does happen, it happened more in the past, but today it's much more handshakes, face-to-face -face conversations. A lot of the real deal making is, is done um, via email after the fact mm -hmm. or on phone calls in between the markets. The markets are just an amazing way to have all these people from all over the world in the same place at the same time to have face-to-face -face conversations. Whereas the film festival is much more, here is a themed lineup, you know, here is an award ceremony, et cetera. Uh, here is the winner, here is a runner-up, and that's good for publicity purposes and building awareness of a film, which is one, only one aspect of the, dis like the business distribution aspect of it. Gotcha. So when you're, um, for, for these independent producers or filmmakers out there that they, you know, they've, they work hard to finish their film or their content, or maybe that gets us like a web series or something that has like a, you know, uh, this original kind of non-scripted series per se, or not say non-scripted, but they, they have something they've created and they have to go to, they're really green. They don't have any connections per se, and they have to go to these markets, um, or even before the markets, they're always looking around like, well, where do I go? What's my next step in terms of I finish something? How do I how do I know to, where to shop it? Like, who who should I find to be a distribution um, partner? And you know, the goal for a lot of filmmakers is like this feeling of like, we finished our film, we got a distribution deal, and that to them, they're done. They, their hands are washed. They have, they can move on to the next project. Um, maybe we could kind of dispel sort of the myths of that or, you know, from the perspective of executives working in the, um, the markets place, you know, how better can a independent filmmaker, um, prep themselves and help their cause as well as help their partnerships with the, uh, the distribution companies, uh, before they even make the deal. Um, Big couple of questions there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, we can kind of, you no, know, it's fine. We, let's, we can break it apart in a couple of different ways. Um, one comment you made is, uh, you know, you make the film, you do the distribution deal, and then you've kind of washed your hands of it and um, you're done. I think one of the first myths to dispel would be that. And, you know, a lot of people talk about the creation of their films as kind of like, you know, having a child or something like that. You and I are both fathers. Yeah. And you and I both know that just because your kid turns 18 and goes off into the world as an adult, you're still a parent and we're going to be parents for the rest of our natural lives. Yeah, that's a good, um, I like that. Yeah, so it's, it's just because you've signed the deal, you know, your film has just transferred into a new kind of realm of existence. It's now kind of a public thing that um, is out there in the marketplace and is being transacted upon, but as a producer, content owner, rights holder, um, you're still responsible for it. You're still gonna oversee it. You're still looking out for its best interests and to make sure that um, the distribution company is kind of fulfilling what they said they would and you know, distribution do deals don't last forever. There will be a point when it comes to expire and you decide to keep it with that company or to move it elsewhere. Um, but I guess the bigger question here is, and I get it, it's asked of me all the time, mm -hmm. you know, filmmakers know how to make films. They know how to create them, how to make them work, how to complete them. And that's where it ends. And that's where they kind of have a panic attack. And I've seen filmmakers sort of drag out the post-production process because they're kind of afraid of that next step, which is what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple of different things you know, a filmmaker, a rights holder can do. Uh, but it's really the only reason, the real reason it's being created is so that it can be transacted upon in that kind of public marketplace. Like that's the real reason for creating this stuff. Um, and for the filmmakers that have the uh, mindset that, you know, they just want to create and they just want to, you know, kind of express their vision that's a great attitude to have, but without understanding the commerce behind it and without understanding that at the end of the day, it is a product that needs to generate revenue, no one's going to invest in future projects. That's yeah. the critical thing is it's gotta make money and 
the, the good thing to keep in mind here is that every media property, assuming it meets basic standards, technical specifications, can make money someplace. And there is a home for it someplace. It just might be in, in a way, you know, you're not thinking in a traditional way. So um, if we look at like a, a normal feature film, and uh -huh. we want to say it's going to go to a distributor, there are multiple ways you can get it there. You can do the film festival circuit, as we just talked about, and, you know, sometimes distributors show up to them. But frankly, like, you know, there's a lot of competition there. Mm -hmm. You can go direct to distributors and say, hey, this is my product, et cetera, and what do you think, and will you acquire it? And then there's the third way, which is, you know, can you just do it on your own and, and create a, a DIY release strategy? All three of these require marketing and self-promotion. All three of these require, and this is, a, this is the next, this is the answer to what happens after you complete it. Yeah. You create a marketing campaign. You create a marketing campaign to make your product, whether it's a web series, one-off, documentary, feature film, whatever it is, to make it interesting, cool, fun, and appear to, if you're trying to get it to distributors, make it appear this is a profitable, stable investment. Even if the distribution company isn't coming in and saying, I'm going to pay you an MG or an advance to acquire your rights, it's just going to be a revenue share deal. Yeah. Um, it still costs them a great deal of time and money to acquire a product, even if there's no down payment. So you got to make sure you're kind of pitching it in a way that says, I am a stable, understanding producer who gets the business side of, you know, how Hollywood works. This is a product that I am, you know, offering to you because I think it fits well with the brand of your company or the mandate of your company if it's a company that goes after family films or action films, whatever. It fits that. It falls into their catalog, so to speak. And you're presenting it in a way that basically says, I'm stable. The film is dependable. Everything is ready to go and ready to be delivered. Um, let's try to work a deal. And that's just as much marketing as if you're going to go out and do a DIY release on your own. Right. So is it best to, um, I guess the strategy would be, um, if you are that creative that just wants to be creative, you better partner, have a partner with somebody who um, has the uh, tenacity and interest in t making it a, a, a co commerce transactional um, process. So that way you're like, you can separate the two. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, here's, Here's the artist, but I partner with somebody who takes my art and then um, really does a good job of like um, doing the marketing, the promoting, you know, pumping it out there. And the question is, do you market it to the targeted audience of the film, which may not necessarily be people in the film industry? Or do you mar try to figure out a way to market it to the executives to make it, you know, what have you seen in terms of like... It's like a no-brainer for executives to go. Oh yeah, that team has got it together. They've they've marketed it to uh, and brought interest to their project this way. Um, but is there a difference that you've seen in terms of who they're marketing it to? Uh, yes, and I think that's actually a pretty interesting collection of questions there. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, one comment first is um, if you have a a, a more creative individual who just wants to deal with the creativity aspects of it. Marketing and business require a hell of a lot of creativity. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of noise in the marketplace and to convey your ideas in a way that stand out and gain attention and to put together structured deals that um, you know make things happen for both sides requires a great deal of <clears throat> creativity and um, innovative thinking. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, a filmmaker or a writer or you know anyone on that kind of side of the table should never just lock themselves in and go, that business stuff is not my world, I'm creative, because it is very, very creative as well. And second is, know full well that my side of the business, the, the, the pure business aspect of, you know, licensing media rights and, and brokering deals, et cetera, is wholly dependent on that creative side. And we really follow the lead of that creative side. So I've, I've brokered big TV deals before where, 
you know, we've had conversations of what channel it should end up on if we're talking to a major network, let's say, and it really ends up just being, what does the script feel like it's going to go with better? Where's the audience going to be better? You know, like, where is it going to more accurately align? We don't change the script and say it must fit this bucket. Yeah. We followed the script because the script and the writer are very talented and we find the best place for that. And the reason is it's going to make a hell of a lot more money by following that than not. Um, so just for your audience to kind of know that, that, you know, we're not all demons on this side. And, yeah, yeah. and the truth <laughs> is like th there is a great deal of, of creativity involved in making these kinds of deals happen. But I guess your other question is, you know, as we're sort of saying, you finished a product, a, a feature film or whatever, what do you do with it? And my answer to that was marketing is that next phase. Um, and then your question was accurately, should you align with somebody who's really good at marketing? Uh, and what is, what is your audience then that you're marketing to? Um, yeah. Aligning with somebody, that's great uh, if you have somebody like that. Um, but that doesn't mean that you cannot do it on your own. Right. It's just it's a different type of thinking. Um, but it's just as creative as I said. Now, how to market that in terms of audience? Um, if you're going to go the DIY route, you're going to create a marketing campaign with websites, microsites, do you know press out there to gain a lot of traction and attention. Um, you're entering into the direct to consumer space where you're, you are actively trying to identify an, a, a real audience of consumers out there, mm -hmm. people who are going to open their wallets and spend their hard earned money on your media property. Um, that would be direct to consumer. That's where you're going to do all those kind of innovative, uh, you know, ideas of, of right. gaining traction and attention. Yeah. Yeah. To get a distribution deal, your audience are executives. They are people who are looking actively for media properties to acquire, invest in, um, pick up where they're going to see merit and potential in it. And so you don't have to worry about all the direct to consumer stuff. They already know those answers. You yeah. know, they know their clients, their direct to consumer clients that they work with and how those companies like to work they're more looking for content where they can facilitate a pipeline of content. So your conversation to them is not going to be about how to make it cool, exciting um, for somebody to click on and watch one time. Your pitch is going to be much more stable and these are the specs of the product. This is what the product is about. This is how quickly and efficiently we can deliver it. This is, you know, it's much more kind of pitching yourself as a stable, a stable entity yourself to do business with. They can, they can make an investment in it and, you know, your product is going to deliver the promise it says it will, which is basically an on-time delivery that they can exploit and not have any QC issues later on. Right, right. So, I mean, that's like the savvy producer who says, okay, listen, um, we're not like we're opting to look for um, a distribution deal, a dif distribution uh, partnership. And so we have this project. It's going to post-production or, you know, even the script stage. Uh, my job is to build these re relationships with these distribution companies. And you said you could do it via online in terms of email by just asking or trying to find out who the right people to talk to. To, to see whether or not the projects you have in place match up with potentially what the those particular executives buying needs are. And then, uh, like you said, um, the conversation just has to further. It, it can't just be like you finish a film, you make a call, the distribution company looks at it and says, yes, we buy it all in like one conversation. I'm assuming that the reality of any type of business, it takes time, it takes the relationship, it may take stages to make sure that the deal uh, or what's being offered and the deal being offered um, are win-win. Um, I guess with that kind of thing, thinking is what is the perspective of the executives in terms of how would they like to be marketed to or the products that come to them? Um, is, is it the executives like yourself are you're trying to, if I understand correctly, you're then trying to sell it to uh, other partners um, in the international space and not necessarily always direct to consumer. Um, so 
what products do you look for that help that um, that sales process go through easier or faster? Um, <clears throat> so you're always good with these giant questions. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's, 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 it's it's great that you do it. It's just um, you know, it's like trying to find like that good foothold to sort of get in there. Um, I think okay. Your audience should really rest assured on this point too. Yeah. Is that like we like this side of the business needs content. We're very hungry for it. We're always always looking for new ideas, mm -hmm. scripts, completed projects. I have I'm I'm in my office now and I'm staring at a table of books, scripts, outlines, and this is all stuff that's been vetted that I just need to be aware of so I can pre-sell it. Um, so there's always a hunger and there's always a need. And that's, that's really, really important for your audience to know, especially those who might be a little bit kind of in that kind of cornered in, not really sure where to begin. The, the hardest thing is just sort of to start and start reaching out and to know with confidence that this side of the business, um, the acquiring side or the distribution side, is willing and open and receptive to taking those calls and pitches. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best way to approach it, and I've, I wrote about this a lot in the book Writing for the Green Light and the new one I'm working on as well, which is kind of um, an overview of just the nuts and bolts of how the distribution business works. Um, it's the idea of making the job of whomever you're reaching out to easier. Executives in Hollywood are very, very busy people. They have numerous titles to screen, numerous projects that they're trying to sell. You know, they're constantly just in the middle of things. And so getting that little foothold of time in there is, is challenging. Mm -hmm. And so making and pitching your project, pitching yourself or pitching your company if you've started one, however you're trying to kind of make that initial uh, first introduction is to let them know that you understand their situation, you understand what they're looking for, and um, to pitch your project in a way that makes their job easier. So if their company is constantly, as I said, looking for family content and you've produced a family project, you can kind of start with that, that this is a family project, it's very much in alignment with your other projects, it's ready to go, and this is these are the details of when it's going into production, who's in it, um, if there's any, you know, partners involved in terms of other companies and you're only looking for international rights versus domestic rights, any, any kind of detailed information, what the budget is, all that stuff, um, you can sort of present that because it's making the job of the person who's receiving the email or the pitch easier. They have all the information they need. It cuts down what would normally be five or six email exchanges of, you know, when is it going to be ready and what's the budget and all those sort of details. It just condenses it all to one quick email and you're coming off as you know what you're doing and you're presenting yourself very professionally. Um, yeah. So it saves time and it fits the mandate of the company. So you're making the job of that person a little easier. And then also, um, again, just to kind of hit on this topic since we started there, uh, you know, I was – at a meeting with an extremely high level executive at one of the biggest, I, I won't say it by name, mm -hmm. just say the biggest global SVOD player in the world. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but I was meeting with one of their like really, really top executives and we're doing a, a, a deal right now on uh, like a, a co-production, not a co-production per se, but like we're partnering together on a, on a pretty big title. And, um, what they told me is just jokingly, like they have learned to accept and review everything and really give it a chance hmm. because no acquisitions executive wants to be the one that missed a gem. Hmm. So just always trust that it's better just to take the first step and get it out there once you have all your ducks in a row mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not get overly anal retentive about every single word in the synopsis and everything, just getting the gist of it in front of the right people once it's at a professional level and worthy of presentation, obviously, because it will be reviewed. 
and it will be you know evaluated as a legitimate opportunity um, because nobody wants to be the one that, that missed the next great thing no matter how big the company or how small so it's just you know to give some more confidence to your audience yeah yeah so I think like you know like like a role-playing thing is if I I'm a producer and I'm just finished um, a film or we're about to finish a film per se like um, we raise the money you know whatever through crowdfunding through uh, rich family members anything like that to get the film done and say and maybe we're in the post-production process and we're feeling good about the dailies. We feel great about the script. We feel good about the product we're creating, and it's in a specific genre. And then my job is then to, um, where do I acquire this list of distribution um, um, companies that I can just start browsing through to see what catalog, the kind of stuff they sold in the past, to see whether or not the film I'm finishing meets sort of something they've done similar. Um, I kind of know, but I just want to make sure that. Uh, maybe you have some other um, reference points that we point uh, filmmakers to or producers to, content creators to. Like, okay, as you're finishing it, you should look at this place to to review all the distribution companies that um, what they sell. In in truth, it's really just getting on any, you know, getting on. Okay, in in independent Hollywood selling movies or selling TV shows, you know, mm -hmm. the, the easiest way to see this visually represented is to hop on like Amazon Prime or Netflix or um, any online platform. And the reason I, I say online yeah. is because when you're flipping through TV channels and it's a linear experience, you don't see it all laid out, kind of like a bunch of index cards on a table. Whereas if you're looking at it on Netflix, you see title A next to title B next to title C. Um, those big studio titles in there, uh, those are the ones that those platforms spend a lot of money to acquire, most of their money. Mm -hmm. Independent Hollywood fills in the gaps between those. And if you're creating, and, and I encourage all of your listeners to um, focus on the indie side of the business and not to pay, not get overly concerned or, you know, uh, focused on the studio stuff because there's so many walls to get over mm -hmm. before you really get to that level. The best entry points are going to be in the independent space. Um, so to look at those fill in the gap kind of titles, whether it's TV, documentary or film, got it, focus on those and whatever your project is, it's a movie about this. It's a documentary about that. It's a very uh, right-leaning conservative documentary. It's a very left-leaning conserv or uh, yeah. liberal documentary. Whatever it is, focus on those. You're going to start to see recurring trends of company names. You're going to start to see recurring names of distribution companies, partnerships of company A and company B, that this type of title is often linked with these other types of titles, that's your best way to start honing in on kind of a bucket list of a couple of distribution entities that seem to have a mandate that mesh with whatever project you're creating. Then, you know, you just start Googling. Yeah. You get on LinkedIn and start searching and you'll find it's all out there. You, you, there's no I mean, 15 <laughs> years ago, this was tough stuff, you know, yeah. like you had to spend some serious cash to acquire these lists and pray they were up to date. Today, people self update all the time and it's all out there. You'll find out who's who in a company. Uh, the key people you're looking for are going to be, and again, I write about this in, in both books, like yeah. the key people you're looking for are going to be in the acquisitions department. I mean, that's literally their job is to acquire media and bring it in. And if it's not acquisitions, it's development. And then you can always reach out to people in the sales team as well, because if a salesperson likes your product, first off, they don't get pitched projects that, that often. And if they like your project, the acquisitions team will take it very seriously because somebody on the sales side is taking an interest and salespeople are the ones who generate all the money. Hmm. So um, it's kind of already being vetted internally. Got it. Uh, but that's kind of how you do it. It's It's you just... You do your market research, you hone in on companies that seem to mesh really well with what it is your product is, 
and then you do your analysis and research. And when you reach out to them, it's this is my pro this is who I am. This is my project. This is its level of completion. It's not complete at all. It's you know in post production. It's finished, finished, and we've been to ten festivals. This is the running time. These are this is the cast. This is the details. This is the budget. Here is a link to the trailer. This is the other thing is a lot of people like to oh I'm afraid to send my movie out there as long as it's password protected on Vimeo that's yeah. okay. But make the job easy for whomever you're sending it to because the you know I get I get hundreds of emails and you know I'm just one of many executives in this business and you know I don't even work at one of the major 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 you know mini majors or major right, studios right. <laughs> like you know i don't want to see what their inboxes look like especially after market oh, boy. um so you know just that's kind of how you do it another comment to make on this because yeah. uh, i've been asked this a few times um and that is let's say you collect your money to make a a, a project um the best time to really reach out to people and to build relationships is when you have the money, you have an idea, you have a script, uh, but that's it. You haven't started production yet. You're just in those development stages, but you have the money, or at least 50% of it or some right, major right. chunk of it. That is the best time to reach out because acquisitions people and development people will see, all right, this person's coming to me early, they have the money, and they're pitching a project that is in alignment with what our company does, and they're asking our advice on how best to make it so that it's a marketable, quality product that will generate revenue uh, within the distribution space. Yeah, Like, this is win, win, win across the board. So an acquisitions person or a development executive will, assuming everything works out perfectly, they'll kind of basically pre-acquire your title with the understanding that they're not putting any down payment or maybe they will a little bit, you never know. Um, but the idea is they can kind of consult and kind of you know, push your project into a realm that's gonna be very sellable. And that's win-win because they have something they're gonna get they know it's coming in the pipeline. They have little, if any, financial risk in it. Yeah. And you, as a content creator, already have your distribution deal set up. In fact, they're giving you advice and, and feedback on what to do and what not to do that's going to make your product really, really sellable in the marketplace and only make you and your title look great in the marketplace because it meshes with all the things that are needed. And your content is sellable out there uh, basically before you've even shot a frame. And you can pretty much start planning your next project um, while you've sort of signed this one over. That's, that's kind of the real way to win this strategy is that mm -hmm. if you get in there early and now you've, and you can shop at the multiple people, it's not like you have to just stick with one, um, and find the company that best meshes with you uh, and that you feel most comfortable with and you like their style and get along with them. Um, but that's sort of the real way to, uh, uh, you know, build those relationships and be taken seriously and all that. I would also say yeah. the best time to do this is um, like June, July, you mm. know, the summer months, because pretty much, you know, the new year hits and there's the... I think it's NAB in yeah. Vegas, then yes. there's NAFI, and then there's Sundance, Sundance. and then yeah. there's Berlin, and then there's Hong Kong, and then there's the MIP TV. And th these are the festivals that, you know, right. I've attended or, you know, that are in my space. Um, and then there's Cannes. It's like yeah. constant until May. And then June, all of a sudden, there's this giant fall off. And people can breathe again. Yeah. And, you know, they haven't been inundated with 10,000 projects and maybe they haven't seen quite what they're looking for. Yeah, it makes once, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Once September kind of kicks, I'd say it's June, July, August, the summer months. Once September kind of kicks up, people start focusing again on TIFF. Okay. And then MIPCOM. And it's just, again, it just starts with that heavy market. AFM site. after that. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's interesting. It's, it's again, just to sort of recap, uh, the takeaway was huge because it's like, all right, I am, it actually reminds me of a friend of mine up here in Portland. Um, and I, I interviewed her for one of my other podcasts, which is like how to get a named actor on your film. And she had approached me. I, she had the script that she wrote, a romantic comedy, and she, um, her name is Kelsey Tucker, and the film's called The Competition. Before, the, the working title is The Pig Theory, but she, we were, we were actors, so we were working together on set one day, and she started to ask me these questions, and I just, you know, gave her my insight um, with all the work that I've done on Film Trooper. But I suggested to her, I go, I realize one of the greatest things that she had, the unfair advantage, the leverage that she had, is that she had raised quite a bit of money, either put away money or raised money for this film, and they haven't even shot it yet. And I was like, you need to go down to like the market, go or and just ask. Don't take my advice. Just go and pr- pr- get your project together, and start asking around what actors and actresses are best suited that would be marketable, and and definitely hire a casting director to assist you with all this stuff. And so she did. She just went down the American film market. You know, she just was uh, around, just meeting with different people, getting a better perspective of how the market works what they're looking for. Um, she had a script. She had money, which is huge. And then she took the time to hire a casting director that saw that they, you know, were vetted. Like that they, that wasn't some, like a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of filmmakers is all they have is a script. They don't have any financing behind it or anything like that. She had a script and some financing. And from that, that opened doorways because um once she was working with the casting director and she got perspective of like what uh, actors would be sellable, um, she worked with the casting director on that knowledge and they were able to get Thor Birch and Chris Klein for the film. They shot up here in Portland and they finished it. And because they were already in works at the early stages of having financing and a, and a great script was that you know, um, I don't know what distribution companies they're going with, but they basically built a very attractive package in terms of the world of romantic comedies because you could see it. Like, here's two notable actors. One was, I think, Oscar Oscar nominated. Thor Birch was, I think, for American Beauty. And, um, you know, like, she put the package together. Like, and, and w- there's another set of filmmakers that will come to the markets and all they have is a script hoping to find a purchasing partner or a finance, somebody to finance the project. And so um, I wanted to ask you, does that exist in terms of the financing part of it? Like where um, where do distribution companies come into play? Um, because that's probably a loaded question too because each one is different. But how do you handle it uh, um, when people just come to you with a script? Like and then they, they don't have that other added element, which is like they have don't have any sort of financing in place to get the, the project to the next level. Well, the experience, okay, the experience of your friend, yeah, um, is dead on, and you use the word vetted, and I think that that's probably the most important. Um, kind of strategy, I guess, in this sort of scenario. She was vetted with money. Yeah. And um, I told her that, she had an unfair advantage. I said, look, at most filmmakers, producers right now don't have that kind of cash at all. They're, all they have is a script and they're trying to get it made. I said, you have something special and everybody's latching onto you right now because you actually have the cash. So use that to your advantage to get the best setup. You know, and, and exactly. definitely go hire a casting director, find name stars to be in your film and you'll be up up off and running exactly and you know this is the kind of thing when i hear stories like that especially if a project like this is in post um i'm immediately curious like oh can you send me her email address or phone number so i can yeah you want my, I, I will i will <laughs> get my foot in the door just get to Kelsey, see, like, I will, yeah i'll tell exactly. you exactly <laughs> um, but i mean like i think that that's actually an interesting thing for your audience to hear as well is that's sort of how these sort of meetings take place at markets i, I will certainly get back to your your question in yeah, just yeah. a second but i mean just the fact of like oh you know i have a friend this is her situation um kelly you said uh kelsey 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 tucker. yeah kelsey tucker uh so um you have this friend, Kelsey, she is in the situation, she has cash, good cast now, good marketable story, everything's moving great. 
um, potentially seeking distribution. That's a project people jump on because all the right elements are there. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest one being money, because that's the most difficult one to achieve. So then the question falls to, uh, well, quickly on this one, um, going to AFM is great because everyone's all in one room. Yeah. But going to Los Angeles and just spending a few days and setting up, you know, five to seven meetings a day and just pitching people one by one in their offices is another fantastic way to accomplish that level of achievement to get a project done. You walk in the door, I have money yeah. done. Like people <laughs> take you seriously. Not only do I have money, I have a casting director on this script for good top notch cast. And I'm not going to be foolish enough to just assume I know what the marketplace wants with cast names. I'm working with professionals to do it for me. Mm -hmm. And here's the script, et cetera. That's a real package that people will take seriously and people want to jump on board, develop it for their own interests, yada, yada, yada. But in an absence of money. And another one thing I think we should get to as well is we've been talking about people who are fortunate enough to start this process before they've shot a frame. We yeah. should also touch on people who've finished their project um, <laughs> yes. and don't know what to do with it as well. Right, right. But, but you have a great script. You have an idea. You don't have any cash. What do you do? You need to get vetted. So if you don't have the cash, what else can you vet in your arsenal? Mm -hmm. If you're going to be approaching these companies, you need to kind of have a couple of key things taken care of. Uh, if it's just you and a script. Well, who are you? And can you get vetted as being someone worthwhile enough to produce it, pitch it? And is the script worthwhile enough for anyone to even open and read? The hardest thing in this business, especially for writers, like isn't getting their script greenlit. It's just getting the damn thing read. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There are so many scripts. There are so many people with ideas and they don't have anything stuck to it or attached to it to make it worthwhile to move forward. So you have to this you have to basically make your project worthwhile of movement within the industry. Can you get your script into festivals and have it judged upon and vetted that way? Can you go to um, individuals who are established writers, many great established writers, uh, you know, after they've won a few awards and all, love to help younger writers kind of gain some traction in their careers mm -hmm. and will coach them and, and get their project into, a, you know, a good space. And in those very, very rare circumstances that, you know, they feel the script is wonderful, will actually open a few doors for you. Yeah, um, yeah. Having people kind of verify this is a great script, um, third party people verify it, will elevate the script. And then you have to elevate yourself. What have you done? If you've not done anything, how can you get vetted by somebody who can assure them that, you know, you're worthy of managing this project, of producing it, that you understand the finer points of it? If you have zero distribution experience, you're going to need to be attached to people who know how to do that stuff. So can you reach out to somebody? Can you go to these markets and meet people who are actively interested in um, partnering with people to get their projects up and running? Like, if there's somebody listening in your audience mm -hmm. who's very excited to be a filmmaker, a writer, a director, a producer, all three, um, there is somebody out there who is equally passionate about producing content and just needs to find a director or writer that they, you know, get along with. Yeah. And they share ideas the right way uh, to do it together. Um, you know, that's how Tarantino and Lawrence Bender work together. Right. Uh, it's it's that's sort of a good kind of initial kick step. And it goes back to the thing of. If, if I'm much more on the creative side, should I just focus on people who can do all the business stuff for me? The answer is no, you, you can definitely do a lot of it on your own, but somebody who has a track record, somebody who has experience and you know a history um, can definitely open more doors, can definitely vouch for you. You know, 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if you if you don't have money, you have to start piecing that stuff together the other way. Um, the other thing is if you can kind of get your way into a distribution company and you just have the script and you can assure them, hey, I'm not looking for money, but I want to make this film. I'm going to manage all the money on my own and find mm -hmm. it. But I want to work with the distributor early and get your views, your feedback, your thoughts, so I can set this thing up properly. What should my budget range be? What should this be? What should that be? What is a good cast? Um, and basically let them, the distribution company, kind of call the shots in terms of if you can do this and, and you can do that and you can do this other thing, we will acquire your movie. Yeah. Well, yeah. having that distribution deal or that letter of intent or that kind of agreement can sometimes be that linchpin for people who are potential investors. Because if you, if you are somebody mm -hmm. with money and you want to invest, the only reason you're investing is because you expect to get money back plus a profit. So the more things you can kind of set up that, that assure people you will get your money back plus a profit will allow money to come in. The more opportunities you can give a distribution company to say, I'm serious, this script is vetted, so am I, they're more likely to take an interest in you and take the time to invest in discussing it with you. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I guess, kind of in a nutshell, the gist of it is if you don't have money, money is a great vetter, but, um, you know, there are plenty of other things you can use to vet yourself, your talents, your script, your project. Yeah, definitely. I was, you got me in thinking about how, I'm going to just run this through just like, it's like a imaginary case scenario is everything that you just said makes me think like, okay, hello, I'm like this producer who has this script or I'm a writer, the producer or whatever it might be. It's like, I have this story. That's all I have. And like you said, and, and if you approach all these dif different distribution companies and you do it, like I say, I'll, I'll follow up in like June, July, August when it's slower, where it might have a better, I met better chance of being, you know, looked at. And by coming to a, a company and, and, and doing my research and saying, I think this script, this genre fits these companies because I've seen them, you know, really similar films. And then you, in the introduction, email, letter, or try to make a face-to-face -face meeting, you can identify that I have this story, I have this script, um, I'll be handling the financing myself, but I want to, you know, get in early with a distribu distribution company like yours because this particular film is similar to the films that you guys have released in the past. And I would love to get your um, input on it before we go down the path of full production. And so that, you know, that might be like, okay, this person is not completely like a, a lunatic that comes in like, this is the greatest thing in the world. You'd be, you know, remiss. You have to like, there's, I'm sure you see all crazy sort of uh, sales tactics or people that just are very, um, especially in the marketplace sometimes, uh, a little clueless, you know, about how it all works. <laughs> and so with somebody coming in that seems to be, you know, level-headed, like, okay, we can take a look at this and then maybe get some input. Like, I see where your your script is going with this and we've done well with these type of genre films and this would definitely fit into that. Uh, let us know how it goes. And like, so we can keep that open uh, conversation going as you develop your project. And, and then hopefully maybe it's just if maybe there's like a letter of intent, like if you're able to secure the financing and get these, you know, everything finished by a certain date, because we would really need it for our catalog when we go into uh, the new year, um, something like that. It's like there's a lot of like ifs, but if you can get that letter and now the producer can go and start shopping around to investors and maybe the maybe they get a little bit of seed money. And maybe the seed money is the higher casting director that has access to a certain named actors or that have a better chance of, you know, those connections with the with the script. And then I think what it is, is like there's a lot of chicken egg type things. But I could see a producer telling a investor saying that here's the deal. We just want to invest a little bit so we have the pay for the casting director so that we can get the script to certain actors. And then what happens then um, if these certain actors agree upon, you know, are interested in the script or doing the movie, um, 
then what we need from you is a full release of some funds to to be all in. Like if I'm an investor and somebody's and a producer is coming to me and they say this is the script, we're really excited by it. This is who we think could be in it. We've already hired a casting director, has access, uh, who has worked with these ca uh, actors before. Um, if they agree to it, would you you know can we have some sort of letter of intent from the um, uh, investor that says you know or handshake that says come in with uh, more money to get the the project finished on top of that we have this letter intent for distribution so that that way now the producer sounds what it is they're deal makers right that's you're, you're dealing with a lot of people that are just deal makers that need to work with the chicken and egg scenario all the time but if they can say like i've got the script you know vetted to a certain point with the distribution company saying they're interested if i'm able to get all these other things in place I have a casting director in place that can get us access to the actors if all these other things come in place. And so I'm just sort of that scenario out there. So somebody listening out into the podcast can go how to, a strategy or a possible strategy of how to work with distribution company, how to get a named actors, how to work with investors so that it looks like you know what you're doing. And then before you know it, before you know it, you might have some money in the escrow that says, okay, we got money into this LLC that we formed and we're off and running. And then now the, the time is clicking because you got a ticking, you got to get the film finished, uh, packaged, delivered, um, all Q, you know, QC'd and delivered to the distribution company as agreed. And the, and the, the negotiations are, and uh, communication will be constant um, during this whole process. But that would be like, a, I don't know, a a type of a scenario have you seen something like that in your time as a, an executive over the years yeah yes and that's not um it's not even i mean that's a that's a very accurate kind of strategy like a like a loose game plan it's yeah in, in a lot of ways it's chicken and egg but it's, it's really more if then yeah you know when you don't have money um you know, there's always a way to find it. There is always a way to make it. There's always a way to create it. Um, so it, it's it's never a, just throw your hands up in the air and say, well, this isn't going to work unless, you know, company A gives me several hundred thousand dollars to make my dream a reality. No, you have to think strategically and think about things that people need and say, well, if I can get that, then can we do this? And you'll start to see answers pointing in the yes direction quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Cast is a great way to approach it because the first question I generally get asked from buyers all over the world is, who's in it? Mm -hmm. Just for an audience, th think about the consumer for a moment. People who don't think about movies and media the way we do, just people looking for something to watch on TV. Um, the faces that appear on the artwork of a media property, vet it for them. Oh, she's in it. Oh, he's in it. It must be good. It's at least worth looking at. Right. That's right. how they watch it. Well, people putting movies up on those consumer-facing platforms know this. So if those types of cast members are in it, they'll put them up and they'll buy them from distributors who have them. And distributors will invest in properties who have those names attached. Reverse strat, you know, reverse think the whole thing, reverse engineer it. That's how it works. So, the more vetted things you can put in there that make your property appealing, that's how you sort of solve this. I don't have cash thing. Everybody starts out without cash, and the people who are born into it, a lot of them burn through it so quickly and go nowhere. So, don't mm -hmm. think that there's something built against you. It's just yet another obstacle of many that even money doesn't necessarily buy your way through. <laughs> so making a media property is really, really hard and takes an incredible amount of effort and persistence. Yeah. And um, those early stages, it's, it's really just tackling, well, if I don't have cash, how do I get it? By looking at the needs that all sides require. Yeah. There's needs in there that you can negotiate without cash or very, very minimal seed money, as you're saying, that are really just to kind of grease the wheels a bit. That's a huge, yeah, that's a huge takeaway. Great. That's a good advice for sure. Uh, listen, as we wrap up here, I wanted to, um, two, I think two quick, 
two questions. One would be we we were discussing like uh, the process if you haven't even made your film yet if you don't have money. But then you were saying there's a whole slew of filmmakers out there had just they went out on their own and they finished something. Now they don't know what to do with it. So how do we address you know a strategy for them who has have already listening out there going well? What do I do? I didn't get any named actors. I I have this. What do I do with this? <laughs> Well, it, the, the big question is it depends on what this is. Yeah. Um, if it's a feature film and it's, you know, a reasonable running time, 75 minutes or so and above, and even if there's no name talents, you know, you, you can always pitch content to distributors in a way that helps them. Mm -hmm. And there are a multitude of distributors who have who are very hungry and require a large amount of content to, to stay afloat. So, um, you know, reaching out to companies that are aggregators who, you know, take content specifically to place it onto multiple digital platforms. They're interesting to talk to for finished content. Yeah. Um, yeah. Reaching out to any distributor who is multi-territorial, who is global or focuses heavily on the international market. Um, and the thing I think to really keep in mind is I would censor as much as possible any evidence of when it was produced. Keep it evergreen. Keep it, um, so don't have, a, if you're going to send password protected links, you know, don't put the year in the password. Like right now it's 2017. Yeah. It's the end of October. Well, January, that movie looks old. And Got by the it. time you do a deal and it gets to be, you know, AFM 2018, that thing's really old. So if you can disguise that a bit, that helps. It will eventually come out, but that's okay. Right. Um, and don't, you can't just put it up on iTunes or, you know, right. any kind of forward facing platform without a plan. You need so much of a plan built into when it's going to be released so that there's a whole audience out there who have pre-bought it or who cannot wait to click the buy button on the, the moment it's released. Yeah. Um, you can't just put it up and, oh, we'll see what happens. You know, you got to go in with a plan. Uh, so I would say if you finished it, you need to kind of be working two angles. Mm -hmm. One is... Let's talk to distributors and see if anyone is interested in acquiring it, picking it up. Um, and again, you just go the same route, which is looking for companies that are in that space or have a similar mandate to what you've produced and, and verify and vet it as these are all the positives. It's finished. It's QC approved. This is ready. This is all done. It can be delivered ASAP. Um, and, and you understand, you know, how it's going to fit in with their, company strategies, et cetera. And the second one as a backup would be to do the DIY. I'm just going to release it myself. You know, yeah. anybody can put their content on Amazon. Anybody can put their content on iTunes. Mm -hmm. um, so there's nothing stopping you from doing that. But if you're going to do it, you get to work on building an audience, building <laughs> momentum, building excitement so that the second it's available, people are willing to open their wallets and transact upon it. And those are sort of the two ways to get it out there right? Um, in that sort of space. It's a much more involved conversation, but I, I, yeah, I don't yeah. want to. Um, no, no, no. It's it's actually great because I think this, that was a, a key nugget to take away from there. It's like if you have a finished film, you could try um, seeing if you have something unique to sell um, to dis distribution companies. And if they buy, they buy. If, if not, look at aggregation companies such as distributor, I think like – uh, quiver things like that are out there where um, they have a different strategy to help you like well we'll get it out onto these platforms um, but then you like I said before you launch have a a, a like basically a product launch you know uh, plan in place in terms of marketing and promotion <laughs> um, as one more last thing is there anything that I should ask you I didn't ask you that you think that is vital information as we kind of wrap up this sort of think tank, uh, I think it's really, really valuable. And I'm probably going to name this episode as like how to sell your movie or how to sell your film to an, a, a film executive. So that way it's very specific to be like, oh yeah, I'm about to finish a film. I, I see this headline on this podcast. I would like to know more. 
So if, with that said, is there something that I, I should have asked you that you think would be vital information for people listening uh, to better approach dis, uh, executors like yourself or other distribution companies? At the end of the day, I think it really just, okay, when I was starting out mm -hmm. and I was more on the creative side, you know, it was a huge, it was really intimidating to reach out to um, distribution companies. Yeah. I had no idea what the hell to ask them and I didn't know what to say. And, you know, it's really intimidating to talk about your project. But um, it's it's important to take a step back and recognize that at the end of the day, it is a product for consumption in the marketplace. And you need to be willing to speak about it as such and to understand that those on the other side of the table on the distribution business need your content, but they just talk about it in a different way. Um, and so just mentally know that, but more importantly, mentally know that they really want to work with filmmakers and, and content creators, um, regardless of their backgrounds and experiences. And um, really, you know, anyone creating media holds a great deal of leverage. Uh, they just don't give themselves enough credit. Hmm. So yeah. um, definitely just, you know, don't get overwhelmed and recognize that, you know, there is a crucial step that needs to be made uh, upon the completion of a media property, and that is to start self-promoting you and self-promoting the property to make it interesting and to speak about it in ways that other people need to hear it and to make the job of other people easy so that they're a lot more willing to screen it, consider it, watch it, uh, and take it on. Yeah. Um, and that marketing starts today, whether your media <laughs> property is finished, whether you're in the middle of production or you're taking a hiatus, get as many stills, get as much background footage, get, you know, uh, uh, elements that you can use for social media, build awareness, make it big, make some noise. Um, so I think that that is sort of the, the key takeaway uh, for all of this and on all of these topics, you know in the future we can go into much more Detailed talks. Yeah. Yeah, definitely Cool. Well that, that I think that wraps up for the hour. I think a lot of great information. I'm excited to get this uh, episode out um, And then I will talk to you after we uh, close off the recording here about some other stuff <laughs> Thanks again, Scott Great good talking to you as always cool Trooper, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs.